Caroline Hyde from London in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Netflix scorches subscriber forecasts with a record second quarter. Why content is king as tech earnings get underway. Plus, Uber fit for business. West Coast head Peter Jonas joins us to discuss their Uber for business platform and rebuilding the company culture without a CEO at the wheel. And the highs, the lows, and the hacks affecting cryptocurrencies. We dig into what's driving digital currency volatility and the Bitcoin sell-off. First to our lead, Netflix's second quarter earnings results. Well, there was a little room for error for the company, which has seen shares climb 30% this year. And the streaming service delivered on its key stat, adding 5.2 million streaming subscribers, with a big portion of that coming from outside the US. Now, as a result, shares are rallying in after hours trading. Check this out, up some 10%. We are record highs if they hold on to these gains. Bloomberg's editor at large, Corey Johnson, joins us from San Francisco completely smashing it on the subscriber side of things and now it seems they've got 50 50 when it comes to international and u.s users i like the way you say smashing it sounds very british it's i guess it would be in your case <laughs> yes yeah, smashing the results are fantastic in terms of the number of subscribers added uh and netflix wants also to focus on its profitability a meager profitability but some profits nonetheless uh, I think in the quarter, as I, as I look at my numbers here right now, uh, you know, the, I guess what I'm really looking at, though, is cash flow. But the number is certainly uh, that everyone's focused on in the markets right now is that subscriber number. And here's why. When investors look at this stock, they don't see the financial results they need to grow into this valuation. What they see is a business that might someday generate those results. How do you have uh, the free cash flow to pay for all that really cool content on Netflix? By having subscribers who pay you every month and keep on paying you. And so what they see from these numbers is an accumulation of subscribers who are, who are sending their credit card numbers in online and those payments keep flowing through. And the hope is that we'll see uh, geographies like in the U.S., and like in Canada, that are profitable, and that that could be the, the future of the rest of the world for Netflix. I mean, amazing, 104 million users now, and they say by 2017, for the first time, international users will at last bring them some sort of profit. Corey, I'm looking at the financial analysis use of Bloomberg. If you type FA Go on Netflix, right. you can see that at the moment, the revenue breakdown is substantially in the US. You're looking at 2016, I'm seeing 57% of revenue coming from the United States, 36% international streaming. They want to get that to 50-50. Do we have any inkling of when revenue will come into line, internationally speaking, and, and, and how they continue? to do so well in content yeah I mean uh, you know I'm you know me I'm always a pessimist here right but when I when I look at these numbers <laughs> and I look at how little of the US population Netflix actually has when it looks like that market is pretty full for them it suggests to me there meant to be a lot of growth for them internationally we'll see how the, the spending patterns are different they don't give us a lot of country by country detail that might be too much to ask in fact uh, somewhat amusingly they got queried by the SEC about doing business with Sudan a country that uh, US companies are banned from doing business with and they pointed out that their uh, revenues are de minimis in Sudan Sudan in fact as low as eight thousand dollars for the uh, the uh, uh, 16 months uh, so the 15 months that preceded uh, their letter to the SEC so the eight thousand dollars in Sudan not, not not moving the needle but I do think it's kind of important because what it tells us is that not every place is going to run Netflix like they do here in San Francisco or they do there in London, uh, Caroline. But in fact, the different parts of the world are indeed different. It's not just about, uh, uh, about you know, the way that the Internet exists in different countries, but people just aren't going to be able to stream as much in, in certain places. They're not going to want to stream the Netflix content as much. And it's still a hit-driven business. They've done a, a, a pretty good job with some really good shows, whether it's House of Cards, which they license, or Luke Cage, which they own. Uh, they've done all right with some of these things, but a lot of their stuff has missed the boat, and that's really tough to do when you're dealing with so many different geographies and so many different cultures. 
Yeah, certainly. It seems as though it's been. That's what really helped the second quarter was an amazing array of content. It was the yeah. new episodes coming from House of Cards, from Black, Orange is the New Black. It was really interesting. If you dig into the letter that you're getting from the CEO to right. investors, they're trying to. He seems as though he's trying to deflect competition here, saying that there is room for everyone. In fact, I think their words are: in fact, they make the internet TV market expand. They're saying, look, HBO has. Exclusive content, more people are using HBO. We have exclusive content, more people are using us, more people are using YouTube. Is he really right? Why is he trying to downplay this competitive landscape? Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's flat out ridiculous. Look, uh, it is true, it's great for us as viewers. And it's great for us if we're creating content, and, and you know, we're both of that, Caroline. But uh, it'd be more fun if we were in Hollywood doing that. But it's horrible for Netflix. Because the cost of the content is going up. And the number that they don't put on the balance sheet, and I bring this up every quarter, is their long-term cost of content. At the end of last quarter, they had over $15 billion, billion with a B, $15 billion in long-term commitments to content, and that number is growing up, going up. How high is it right now? We don't know. They're not going to tell us until they release their quarterly filings. What's really interesting about today's report is they put a separate presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, on their investor relations page explaining the accounting for those long-term, those 10-year commitments in content. But I will tell you, for a business that's getting a $50 million profit every quarter, I'm rounding down, and has $15 billion in long-term content, I'm also rounding that down, it's hard to pay for $15 billion in content when you've got a run rate of profits that's about $100 million. And even if you want to go 10 times that, it's still hard to pay for that. So they're going to have to jack up profits a lot. And so the problem with Hulu and HBO yeah. and Showtime and everyone else out there that's raising the cost of content in Amazon Prime is that they're raising it for Netflix when Netflix doesn't have free cash flow to burn. In fact, in this quarter, Netflix lost yeah. over a half a billion dollars in free cash flow, and that's not that just can't continue forever. It certainly can't, Corey Johnson. Stay with us for just a moment, though, because I want to go into another company where profits always key to the eye. Because there's a stock we're continuing to watch: meal kit delivery company Blue Apron, dropping as much as 12% in Monday's trading session. That's after Amazon filed a trademark application for prepared food kits. Blue Apron tried to calm investor fears about potential competition coming from the e-commerce giant during its IPO roadshow. Well, now Amazon's interest in meal kits seriously undermines that pitch. Corey, Amazon gets in everyone's space. It had already been flagged into Blue Aprons, but now with this trademark coming out over the weekend, it's clear it wants to eat Blue Aprons lunch. So to speak. Really? Yeah. You just did that. Eat Blue Look, I did that. I, I, so I think the market's got this one wrong, too. Um, uh, nobody asked me, but uh, I'm telling you anyway. Because <laughs> Amazon, not, Amazon is not even in this business yet. And if you, you know, if you know anything about the restaurant business, you know that food offerings fail all the time. That just announcing you're going to get into a business doesn't mean you're going to do it well. And so, uh, you know, Blue Apron's failing on its own in, in terms of its marketing expenses, where it's spending 25% of revenues 25% of revenues on its marketing costs, where its cost wow. of adding new subscribers is hundreds of dollars and going way up. They can't keep the subscribers they got. They're spending more and more to acquire new subscribers. And that's the problem with Blue Apron's business. Restaurants are tough. Food delivery is tough. But if you get the blend right, if you've got the right recipes, if you've got the right cost, if you're able to give people what they want, a meal that's quick enough to cook, uh, tastes good enough, and delivered in the way they like it, I think that these businesses could be very successful. What we see in Blue Apron is that they're not able to get to the scale they want to get to uh, affordably. And so unless they can start to fix that, and I really think that's probably ultimately about the recipes, unless they can fix that, uh, they're going to have a struggle whether Amazon's competing with or not, but Amazon's going to have the same problems and have to solve that same problem. And all eyes on HelloFresh, of course, in Europe, which is run by Rocket Internet, well, owned in large part by Rocket Internet. Thank you to Bloomberg's editor at large, Corey Johnson, Thanks. whipping us through Netflix and indeed Blue Apron. And now, coming up, Tesla adds two new executives to its board after months of pressure from investors. We'll break down the decision next. This is Bloomberg. Now to Tesla. Shares falling as much as 4% in Monday's session. This after a Minnesota man initially claimed his vehicle suddenly accelerated after he engaged the car's driver assistance system.
system and crashed into a marsh. Now, despite today's decline, Tesla stock has actually rallied over 47% this year, driven by anticipation of Tesla's cheaper Model 3 sedan starting production. Elon, in fact, seemed to query if this had gone a bit too far over the weekend. Meanwhile, Tesla also added two new executives as directors today. According to a company blog post, James Rupert Murdoch, the CEO of 21st Century Fox, and Linda Johnson-Rice, that's the chair of Johnson Publishing, will join Tesla's board. Joining us now is Bloomberg's David Welch from Detroit, and plenty to digest. Let's do the, the new ex uh, board members first, because this comes after a plenty of pressure coming from investors. I think we're having a few technical difficulties with David. David, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, just fine. I can hear you now. Oh, great. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk about the board members first. Plenty of investor pressure to do this. Yeah, there was. Like this goes back to April. You had a, a handful of pension funds who were really pushing you on to add people to his board. And this is because he has he has a seven person board, one of whom is him. Five of the other six have connections to him or to SpaceX uh, or to Solar City, which has now been merged into Tesla. So they're basically mostly insiders who are helping him run the board. And as you recall back to the Solar City merger last summer, there was a lot of uh, dissension among investors who said that that company too was run by his cousins and you really had two boards of people who knew each other agreeing to get together so you have all this pressure coming up and then Elon said about April okay we're gonna add two new members to the board but a lot of shareholders still weren't happy they wanted him to actually have annual elections instead of a staggered board with three-year terms so yeah. you put it all together you have a couple of new people coming on they're both uh, media executives I'm not sure this will keep everybody happy though because you still have uh, a large number of kind of Elon insiders are friends right alongside him. Yeah, and talking of David, the, how investors might not always like what <laughs> Elon Musk has to say, we have seen CEO Elon Musk saying over the weekend that the company's current share price, he in fact mentioned that perhaps, have a listen. I've gone on record several times as saying that the stock price is higher than we have any right to deserve. Um, uh, and that's for sure true based on, you know, where we are today and have been in the past. So the stock price obviously ref reflects a lot of optimism about where Tesla will be in the future. Now, Musk cleared up those comments on Twitter today, writing that, I should clarify, Tesla's stock is obviously high based on past and present, but low if you believe in Tesla's future. Place bets accordingly. David, what do you make of this, this backtracking, so to speak, and what it meant for the share price? Well, it's just another day in the life of a Tesla investor, right? He <laughs> says over the weekend they're overvalued, so the shares open down. There's a car accident uh, in one of his cars involving autopilot, and the shares go down some more, and then it turns out that it didn't really involve autopilot, according to the uh, the owner of the car, and the shares come back up a bit. So he, it bounces around all that uh, in just one day of trading. That's, that's kind of how these people live. Elon has said this before, that the shares are overvalued. I think he's trying to take maybe a little bit of the pressure off of him. Uh, off of himself because they've got a very big year. They've got, uh, you know, this year and next, they've got to launch the Model 3. It has to be pretty flawless, and they've got to show a profit eventually to deliver on all of the expectations that even he is talking about. So I think that's what's, uh, what's driving a lot of what he's saying right now. Fascinating stuff, and you even brought us that rather complicated news of an autopilot issue that apparently wasn't an autopilot issue. David Welch, great coverage as ever. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Detroit. Now coming up, we bring you a sit-down with an Uber executive on the prospects of growth for the embattled startup after a tumultuous few months. This Now, there is a mass exodus happening at Hampton Creek. The entire board of the food startup has reportedly abandoned ship. Now, that's according to people familiar with the matter who say the only board member left was well, CEO Josh Tetrick. At least five directors have quit over the past month. Others were either fired or have walked out since April. The news comes after a string of controversies last year, including a Bloomberg report showing that Hampton Creek quietly bought back its own products from supermarkets. 
Now, the Global Business Travel Association Convention has kicked off in Boston. The annual event is the world's largest business travel event, hosting over 7,000 business travel professionals from around the world. One big name in attendance, it's ride-hailing giant Uber. Bloomberg editor-at-large, Eric Schatzker, caught up with Uber's West Coast head, that's Peter Jonas. He started by asking about the company's corporate program, Uber for Business, and how it differed from its traditional ride offerings. Take a listen. Uber for Business is effectively a tech, uh, it's a tech layer, a platform that we put on top of the existing application. And what, where that came from was in the early days of Uber, we saw a ton of, of momentum coming from the business traveler community. And as a result, we realized there was a lot of friction for business travelers that we could remove. Uber for Business initially was intended to remove that friction, and we're continuing to extend the, the reach of Uber for Business outside of that and into other avenues as well. Okay, so you're, as you're trying to appeal to corporate customers, mm -hmm. what services do you feel you need to add, or is this tech layer, as you described it, fully baked already? So I think of it as, so Uber moves people and things, right? In, in the most fundamental sense. We're putting people in cars, we're putting things in cars. For businesses, this is about your employees, it's about your customers, so moving your customers either to bring them to an event like this um, or to send them home from the auto dealership when they drop off their car for, uh, for repair. And then finally, there's, there's the movement of goods. So you want to get goods to customers, pull, pull things from customers. So as we start to build this business out further and this platform out further, we focused on the low-hanging fruit, which is business travel, where we know the most because there's so many people already using it, and it's a $250 billion market opportunity globally. As you know, Uber has been prospecting for growth on a lot of fronts. Mm -hmm. Food, logistics, freight, self-driving cars, flying cars, mm -hmm. for example. How fast does Uber for Business need to be growing to remain a strategic priority? <laughs> You know, at, at Uber, we really focus primarily on the customer experience. Are we solving big enough experiences for our customers? And the answer is yes. The roadmap that we have is, is going to continue to have us solving more and more interesting problems as we evolve the business. Um, Do you so, see growth accelerating? We see growth accelerating. Uh, Peter, a lot of Uber's success was the product of deals that Emil Michael did, mm -hmm. uh, and he was instrumental in the early days of Uber for Business. Now that he's left the company, where does that leave Uber? So we're set up for success. The, the work that's been done by the team over, over the last five plus years, six years, um, has set us up in many ways, strategically, domestically, internationally, uh, for success. So we're, we're in a really great place. And what about Travis? How have things changed since he left as CEO? So, it's been a very short period of time. The company is incredibly focused on solving the issues that we have in front of us. We're focused on solving the cultural issues, the leadership, the leadership aspect we're focused on. And then finally, from a, um, from a driver perspective, you've probably seen the, the recent releases around tipping, the wait time pay, all of these sorts of things are our um, action to, to start to solve for some of the things that have been exposed over the last few months as issues. You came in only a few short months ago mm -hmm. from Facebook. Given the culture that you knew there, did you see those as, as deficiencies at Uber when you arrived? And did you see a need for them to be changed in the way that they're being changed now? So I'll tell you this. Coming in from Facebook, Facebook has an amazing culture. Uh, Facebook, that, that is something that's been cultivated over the years. Uber absolutely has all of the nuggets of, uh, that you need to build a great culture. And it's just a matter of maturity and, and the, the, the leadership structure, the organizational structure continuing to evolve, which we're heavily focused and invested, on now, invested in now. Here's what outsiders wonder, and perhaps insiders as well. Whether it's Uber for business, whether it's Uber Eats, whether it's the Uber app that we mm -hmm. know that is evolving, how does a company make big and important decisions without a CEO? I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that question. But you have to live with the consequences of that situation. Yeah. So, so who's calling the shots for you right now? 
So there are a myriad of different people who were already in place when when the executive team that left left, and they're incredibly um, competent leaders. They understand the business at great depth, and they've really taken the reins. Do you think morale is a risk, given the fact that something so many employees are looking forward to, an IPO, is effectively on hold until the management issues are resolved? We're really focused on resolving any sort of morale issue. I think as we start to really have things like what you saw from the from the driver uh, rollouts, as we start to put the people and the pieces in place for a for an evolved culture, I think that's going to be solved. Having spent so many years, seven years at Facebook, you know what a Sheryl Sandberg can do and has done for that company. Would you Absolutely. like to see her come and run Uber? <laughs> I can't comment on that. <laughs> Obviously, I think any company would be happy to have someone like Cheryl. That was Uber's West Coast head, Peter Jonas. Coming up, we bring you Airbnb's global head of business travel. Get his take on the startup's next phase of growth. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The war in Afghanistan killed a record number of civilians during the first six months of this year. That's according to a UN report released today, which blamed the majority of 1,600 deaths on bombings by insurgents. The UN report did commend Afghanistan's security forces, saying fewer civilians were caught in the crossfire compared to last year. British Prime Minister Theresa May is expected to remind her cabinet tomorrow about the need for privacy. That is after several leaks aimed at the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond. Hammond reportedly described public sector workers as overpaid and allegedly made a sexist comment. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in is following through on a campaign promise to pursue dialogue with North Korea. Moon's government has proposed resuming talks on military and humanitarian issues with Kim Jong-un's regime. The EU has agreed to consider further measures against North Korea after it conducted its first ICBM test. But the bloc stressed that tensions on the peninsula had to be resolved peacefully. Military-to-military -military dialogue between Seoul and Pyongyang is also on the table. Thailand's new king has tightened control over what is reputed to be the world's richest royal fortune. It's estimated at more than $30 billion. King Maha Vajiralongkorn succeeded his father last year. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Back to work Monday here in Washington, 7.30 Tuesday morning now in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen. He's got a look at the markets. Paul, good morning to you. Good morning, Elisa. Looks like it could be a bit quiet around the Asia Pacific today. Nikkei futures are off a little, but uh, let's just call it flat. Uh, similar story for the ASX here in Australia. Futures currently down by just four points. We'll be keeping an eye on a few resources stocks today. Uh, oil search up with quarterly production numbers, as is Rio Tinto uh, for the second quarter. Production numbers there could be affected uh, by weather on uh, both the west and east coasts of Australia. We're also waiting on the Reserve Bank minutes for the month of of July wasn't very exciting. The cash rate got held at one and a half percent. Not even the wording of the statement changed a great deal. Uh, but we'll be looking for uh, more signs of lingering concern over household debt, weak wages growth, and maybe the Aussie dollar might feature as well. That's been creeping up towards 80 cents US. Elsewhere, waiting on the second quarter CPI numbers out of New Zealand and property prices from China. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in for Emily Chang. And Airbnb is making a push into the world of business travel, putting the company in even more direct competition with hotel chains and threatening the lodging industry's cash cow. Now, we send it out now to Bloomberg editor-at-large, Eric Schatzka, who's standing by with Airbnb's global head of business travel. Eric. Caroline, thanks very much. I'm here with David Holyoke of Airbnb for Business. David, good to see you. Thank you. Thanks the for having corporate me. lodging market is enormous, right? Billions, tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars. Help us understand where this fits into Airbnb's business and strategy now. What percentage of Airbnb's revenue does it account for? And if you're successful, how much could it account for, say, two, three years from now? Yeah, so today it's 15% uh, of our trips. Uh, that's how we kind of look at it from, uh, from a standpoint. And by 2020, we expect it to be about 30% of our, our, of our business. With Airbnb presumably growing along at the same pace, so yes. it's going to be vastly Even, larger. Right. Yeah, we will grow at a 4x clip, uh, Airbnb for business. This year we grew at a 3x, uh, and we'll pretty much keep that trajectory uh, for the next few years. So as the core business is growing, you know, we, that's our challenge to continue to keep up with that pace. We were talking about the partnership that Airbnb signed with Concur. Here's my question. Why is it necessary, if you will, to crawl into bed with the established hierarchy in global business travel? And the reason I ask is because there are so many companies that occupy that middle ground, all of which are taking something in the way of a fee out of the business that you want to be able to do directly with your end customer. Yeah, I, I, the answer simply is that companies need to be able to, to have visibility uh, for their employees, right? There's also obviously a duty of care element to that, right? And so you're going to need to work uh, through some channels to help them manage that. And Concurs just was a logical partner. There. So you will, will your inventory similarly end up on Carlson Wagon Lead or BCD or American Express or any of the other established business travel, you know, managed travel service companies? Well, um, so what I would say today is that we have third-party booking capability on Airbnb.com today. So it's possible for anybody to book on behalf of a guest and a host. How that evolves over time, I, you know, I, I think those are conversations we'll continue to have with the... David, how do you anticipate or expect the hotel industry to respond to this incursion by Airbnb on its most profitable turf, business travel? Well, I don't lose a lot of sleep about what the hotel <laughs> industry uh, is doing. Um, ultimately, why um, not? Well, I mean, look, they've got a business, um, and we have a business. Um, we're not uh, here making a direct assault on the hotel industry. Uh, we think we're a complement uh, to, uh, to a, a traditional accommodation program. Uh, and simply, we really look for where the use cases uh, maybe are not ideal uh, with a hotel and where we could you know, compliment there. Well, they see it differently, and that shouldn't surprise you. The American Hotel and Lobbying Association is already complaining that the playing field is not level, that, that it's unfair, if you will, because Airbnb uh, doesn't or the, the properties on Airbnb don't have to comply with many of the rules and regulations that the whole hotel industry must comply with, for example, at access for disabled people. Well, I would say first that we have over 275 agreements in place with cities and municipalities uh, around the world. And we continue to show in good faith that we want to work with governments uh, and with communities to, to make sure that this is done in a responsible way. I can only imagine, though, A, if I were disabled, fortunately I'm not, may end up being disabled at some point, I would think of that as a fairly legitimate complaint. And I'm sure there are disabled people who would, sh who would share that point of view. Secondly. Is it really, is it reasonable to expect that the people who would list their properties with Airbnb for business would go and make the kinds of investments that the hotel industry has had to make to bring those properties up to the standard for fair disability access? Well, I don't want to comment necessarily on the, on, on the Fair Disability Act, but I mean, I can tell you what we continue to do around standards with our properties. Uh, and so business travel ready homes are a prime example of that, where we literally have uh, a subset of our three and a half million uh, properties around the world have, have convenience features, check-in features, uh, safety uh, features that ultimately are more in line with what you would expect through a business travel. What are some of the other challenges and or requirements you need to be able to meet to deliver a business-ready lodging product compared with what 
many of us might know as an Airbnb uh, for for leisure purposes. Yeah, so you mentioned some of them. Yeah, so first it's um, it, there are full homes or full apartments. All right, so uh, so it's the actual residence that, that you would have access to. Uh, it's the abil it's 24/7 check-in, so it's the ability as business travelers come and go as needed to, that you work. Um, on their time frame. Uh, there's safety features, things that you would expect uh, to be up to code, smoke detection, carbon monoxide detection. Uh, and then there's a, what you would call around essentials. You want to make sure there's reliable Wi-Fi. You want to make sure that uh, um, things that a business traveler wouldn't want to have to pack on the, on the road are, are made available in the home uh, for them. Are, is maintaining quality control over these properties, I have to imagine it's it, it involves more on the part of Airbnb than your leisure properties do. Well, we care a lot about quality. Uh, we do a lot uh, working with our host community, ultimately to to make sure that they're educated about what guest needs are and where they can continue to de deliver a very memorable experience. Uh, and as we go forward, we'll continue to refine and look for areas that we can improve on the quality. To the degree, David, that the hotel industry is successful in waging its battle against what they perceive as a threat, Will you respond similarly to the way that Airbnb has in cities like San Francisco and New York, which is fight for your own interests? Well, I think, I think we continue to demonstrate our commitment, right? We, in good faith, sit down with cities around the world uh, to find what their concerns on and how we can work together. Obviously, Sometimes it gets pretty acrimonious. Uh, but ultimately, we're protecting a community. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're doing right by our guests and our hosts as we go forward. All right, David, I want to thank you very much. Thank nice you. to see you here. Yeah, uh, Caroline, that is David Holyoke. He's the global head of Airbnb for Business. We are at the Global Business Travel Association Convention in Boston. That's why we had this chance to talk back to you. Coming up, IBM is betting big on cybersecurity. How Big Blue is planning to bring end-to-end -end encryption to all your data. Next. wanted to make something that's cutting edge and is going to make the world sit up and take notice. It's diversified, it's a true ecosystem. You're really changing industries and you're changing processes. You need those skills, you need that information. To another interview for you because the cybersecurity industry is booming with no signs of slowing down. According to market research firm Zion, the sector will reach over $181 billion in global revenue by 2021. That's partly driven by corporate fears of hacks and losing confidential information as the scale and frequency of major hacking attacks continues to rise around the world. Now, one key tech giant is betting big on cybersecurity, it's IBM. The company announced a rollout of the IBM Z, its next generation mainframe that's capable of handling 12 billion encrypted transactions a day. The mainframe seeks to address cyber attacks which have compromised financial data. Joining us now to discuss from Cambridge, Massachusetts, is IBM Vice President of Threat Intelligence, Caleb Barlow from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Caleb. And first of all, I mean, Talk to us about the new Z14 mainframe. You're working with companies. They've advised you that they want encryption. How big a departure, how, how big a step, a revolution is this? Well, this is actually a really big deal. In fact, this is the largest innovation on the Z platform in a decade. And what this really involves is looking at encryption and how we make it pervasive. So in this particular case, we're talking about a system that, as you mentioned, can process 12 billion transactions a day. Now, to put this in perspective, let's take something like Cyber Monday as an example. Now, on Cyber Monday, we see maybe 30 million transactions globally. This single system can process up to 12 billion transactions a day. Now, part of the technology that comes into play in this is this new chip. Now, on this chip, we have over 6.1 billion devices, 14.4 miles of wire. 
and there are 24 of these in a single new IBM Z. How difficult was it to do? How much R&D, how much time? Because you were doing this over the course of two years with, what, 150 companies you're talking to. Yeah, so we worked with a variety of companies, including uh, companies like Highmark Healthcare, uh, who services about 50 million Americans in the Pittsburgh area, along with companies like ADP. And, you know, what's really important to our customer base is that they have a way to encrypt traffic and encrypt data. You know, if we look over the last five years, over nine billion records lost or stolen, and only 4% of those were encrypted. Now, why is that the case? Well, historically, it has been simply too expensive, and I don't mean expensive just in terms of money, expensive in terms of processing time, in order to encrypt all of that data. So one of the things the new IBM System Z does is makes that encryption everywhere pervasively possible. How expensive is it, therefore, if I want to upgrade to this new mainframe? Well, for new customers, this new mainframe costs about a half a million dollars. But when we consider that the average cost of a data breach is about $3.6 million, this is a pretty good bargain considering the threat that's out there. And of course, those numbers go up or down depending on the number of transactions and the configuration that a particular client might have. And have you got clients already locked in considering you've been working with them on this, understanding what they want and what they need? How, how big a mass adoption do you need for this to really make inroads? Well, because we've worked very tightly with clients along the way, we know that this is something that is badly needed. And let, let's put it this way. You know, 2015 was a great example of the problem. In 2015, in fact, just the first half of 2015, 100 million people lost their healthcare records. Now, those healthcare records contain immutable data, data that can't change, like your social security number, the fact that you have diabetes, your mother's maiden name. Now, if we think about that, that's roughly one in three Americans lost this data forever. If that data had been encrypted, all the bad guys would have is gibberish that they couldn't even read. So that's why this is so important to us. You see, you have to remember, that most of what we're dealing with is organized crime on the tune of a $445 billion industry every year. So if we can pervasively lay down encryption on top of our data, we can change the economics for the bad guys, making it more difficult and more expensive for them to get access to our critical data. How much do we need the whole ecosystem to take this on, though? Because clearly, if one company starts encrypting their data, that helps in some means. But there's so much interconnection between businesses nowadays. How much of the entire corporate America, for example, do you need to get on board and use this if you're going to be able to stave off these sorts of attacks? Well, you, you know, you're on a very key point here. Encryption and having encryption pervasively is incredibly important, especially when we talk about large transaction volumes. Now, the beauty of this is most people end up having their data on a System Z and they may not even realize it. In fact, you know, 87% of all credit card transactions occur on System Z. So part of what we're trying to do here is make this possible. And then you're absolutely right. What we need to do is make sure that encryption occurs everywhere, regardless of what platform it operates on because it's simply so important to protect our data. And what about regulators? How are they reacting to this? Because many have a headache when it comes to encryption for our own use of, of communication when it comes to the likes of WhatsApp that's owned by Facebook. Are they going to be able to access some of this encrypted data if needs be? Well, the keys are in the hands of the customer, generally speaking. So in those cases, they would need to go to the individual that actually owns the system and get access to those keys. But remember, we're talking about back-end transaction systems. We're not talking about like a phone or a consumer device that has, for example, GPS information, things like that. You know, I think we can all agree, if we're talking about our travel records, our banking records, our healthcare data, I think these are things that as a society, we can all agree best kept in a locked up safe. I agree. IBM Vice President of Threat Intelligence, Caleb Barlow, great to have you live from Boston, Massachusetts. Of course, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Coming up, a hack into the latest initial coin offering sparks more questions over cryptocurrencies. We'll discuss what's behind the digital currency sell-off. And a quick programming note, Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker interviews IAC chairman and founder Barry Diller at a panel event from the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Catch that conversation this Tuesday. It's 1 p.m. Eastern.
Let's play back. It's 8 a.m. in Dubai, 5 a.m. in London. Oil hit a three-week high after OPEC wrong-footed everyone. So we're seeing people start to talk about this is the beginning of some change in the region. We're seeing some analysts already pinpointing. Our interest now is the infrastructure projects. The demand for oil continues to rise. All in all, the global economy is growing. Opportunity exists. Now, Bitcoin investors have been on a wild ride this year with the digital currency more than doubling before slumping last week into what is technical analysts label a bear market at one point falling below $2,000. It's lost a third of its value since its peak in June. Now, we're going to discuss what's driving the wild swings in the market for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies with Lily Katz, who covers the cryptocurrency space for Bloomberg News. And Lily, talk us through it, because interestingly with Bitcoin, there's some real build-up towards the end of this week where there's a so-called soft fork. We could even see Bitcoin split in two. Remind us. Yeah, so after just last month, Bitcoin had surged to an all-time high of around $3,000. And within the last couple of weeks, it's lost around a third of its market value, which is pretty wild. Uh, in the last couple of days, it fell below $2,000. And there's a lot of stuff that's been going on in the cryptocurrency world. But one of the hottest debates recently has been what uh, people call the scaling debate. And so for the last couple of years, as Bitcoin has become more and more popular, um, its blockchain has experienced some congestion uh, and slower transactions and higher transaction fees. And these two sort of main rival camps have emerged. Uh, and they both have their own ideas about how to deal with these issues. And so uh, everyone in the cryptocurrency community is gearing up for August 1st, which is when we're sort of going to get an idea of who uh, wins the battle here. So one side has proposed the software update, um, but if less than 80%, I think, of Bitcoin miners implement the update, then there's actually a chance that Bitcoin could split into two and that there might be two separate cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah. So this has caused a lot of volatility in the market. It's interesting that we have seen some sort of precedent for this before because Ethereum, a rival cryptocurrency, did split into as well. We've got Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Talk to us rather about the other cryptocurrencies because it's not just Bitcoin that's seen a sell-off. We've seen Ripple, we've seen Ethereum, we've seen the, the many other cryptocurrencies down. Why? Yeah, you know, I think uh, investors tend to lump cryptocurrencies together is one thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole cryptocurrency market has lost a substantial portion of its market value. I think um, back in June when it peaked, the whole the market value of the whole cryptocurrency market, which is made up of more than 800 different digital coins, was around 115 billion, and now it's around, you know, 70 billion. So I mean, the scaling debate, which we just talked about, is uh, definitely one thing. I think I, you know I've heard people say that maybe some of the interest and excitement around these initial coin offerings has also started to wear off. And then, of course, there are yeah. also just continuing concerns around security and safety. Talk to us about those initial coin offerings, because we saw one today. They didn't go quite according to plan. I mean, a hack actually affecting one that, that seemed very easy to do. Yeah, so there is a startup company called Coindash. And it is a, uh, they offer a cryptocurrency based trading platform. Uh, and today they were scheduled to start their initial coin offering. And they were planning to raise, they're hoping to raise around $12 million uh, in that ICO. And they were hacked and they lost, uh, I think, around $7 million. Uh, they said that the address that they had told investors to send money to was compromised and uh, exchanged with a fraudulent address. And so $7 million was stolen. They had to stop um, the ICO. And they told investors that they would refund uh, the money. But this kind of just adds to concerns in the market about security. There have been other hacks. So it's yeah. uh, definitely something that investors are focusing on. Fred Wilson, a famed VC in New York, saying, look, it's easy come, easy go sometimes, and don't always expect to lack any volatility. Thank you very mm -hmm. much indeed. Bloomberg's Lily Katz, fantastic reporting, making a very complicated situation very easy for us to understand. Thank you. Now, coming up, we're going to be, of course, discussing the next edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tuesday's show will be interviewing from the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.